welcome to Motormouth, brought to you by the Boyertown Museum of Historic Vehicles. I'm Kendra. I'm Dan. And we're here at the museum. We're located at 85 South Walnut Street in Boyertown, Pennsylvania. And we'd love for you guys to come visit us here at the museum. We're open Tuesdays through Sundays, 9.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. And we're closed major holidays and well it's December we got some major holidays coming up so we will be closed Christmas Eve Christmas Day and then New Year's Eve and New Year's Day uh, but we'll be open there from the 26th to the 30th in between uh, so it's a great time if you've got family visiting from out of town and you're wondering you don't even know what to do with them anymore and you're starting to stare at each other bring them here we're open so we'd love to see you. Um, and it's going to be a, a new calendar year soon. And our hours will be changing in 2016. Wow. Did you know that? Well, um, yeah. Oh, that was good, though. I, was, I truly thought you didn't know well, that for a second. I, I think it's neat that they're changing. Yeah. And it might mean a little more work for the museum, but... Yeah, it'll be worth it. It's all about the customer. That's right. Starting in 2016, we will be open seven days a week. Right now, we're for the rest of December, so we have like three more Mondays. Mm -hmm. We're closed, uh, but starting in January, we will be open seven days a week. Same hours. Same hours. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, okay. I should say different mm -hmm. days. Yep, more additional. days. More days. Additional, yes. Same same hours, though, 9.30 to 4, so we're mm -hmm. excited about that. Yep. Um, so yeah, that's, you know, we're kind of winding down here and we're starting to look ahead to next year. Um, and that's really the only announcements I really have mm -hmm. about what's going on at the museum right now because the holidays, we're getting crazy, but we got, always have a good topic here got on the my, show. Got all my, uh, got my Christmas present bought yet? No, you didn't? Okay, no, I, I don't was, need one. I was waiting for a helpful hint to tell oh. me what you wanted. <laughs> no. <Yeah. laughs> Well, let's see. I, I can give you a helpful hint. It's like, see the blue thing sitting out there in the floor? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. You'd you like something like that? You can get me one of them, yeah. So. Matchbox. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway. So, I'm ready to start. You ready for me? I'm ready. <laughs> okay. I was born ready. What we're going to talk about tonight is air. Hot air? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm already given the hot air part. <laughs> This is fresh air. There oh, okay, you go. Okay. Okay. Air and tires, and um, and we came across something. Actually, somebody uh, loaned us a piece of equipment, and it's it's right here. We're going to talk about this later, but um, this was loaned to us, and I was looking at it, and I thought this would make a good TV topic. And there's um, this is an air pump, by the way. And I started looking into air pumps and such in vintage uh, material, like 20 years ago, 95 years ago, and there's all sorts of things. And again, and we mention this pretty much every show probably, is 100 years ago, they were still figuring out this whole automobile thing and, uh, you know, how to drive it, how to ride, it, all, all sorts of things. So how to repair it. How to repair it, yes, because <laughs> they would fall apart because the roads were still being figured That's out right. too. And so I'm going to be talking about different types of air pumps for old cars. And, you know, you might be thinking, well, an air pump is an air pump. Well, there's a lot of interesting things because what I just held up, um, unless you really know what that is, you've never seen an air pump like that. Um, but the first one I'm going to talk about is um, the regular old air <laughs> pump like you used to have in bicycle. Did you have one on your bicycle, a little cylinder and you'd stand on one end and pump. Yes, little tiny <laughs> handle. Yeah. yeah, and you pumped and pump and pump and pump and it didn't. Didn't do anything. Yeah. It, okay, they had all sorts of them way back when. Um, they had compound pumps too. Now, a compound pump would be with two cylinders instead of the one. And you basically pump it from the big cylinder and go into the little cylinder and then through the hose to your tire. And then they had triple uh, cylinder pumps and did the same thing. Um, I came, I saw another one online and it has two cylinders that look, I don't know, three, four inches in diameter, but they're only a few inches high. And yeah, they were next to each other. You had a handle going up and you just pump it back and forth and it was a compound pump. It would 
pump the fresh air into one cylinder and then compress it into the second one and then out through the hose to your tire or whatever you were blowing up. I thought that was kind of interesting. And all, all other types of things, Baldwin double compound pump that was a cylinder within a cylinder. But anyway, that's regular hand pumps that we're pretty much familiar with. Then we have another one here. This is a Yankee pump. Um, this is on loan from... Um, Miss um, Susan viewer. Klinger, okay. who actually, and we thank her for letting us borrow this tonight, she emailed us at the museum asking for more information on it because they couldn't find anything on it. Mm -hmm. And I sent it to you because auto accessories are your, that's, that's my your deal. thing. Yeah. And you got all excited because you, well, go ahead. You already yeah. had ads. Because I was sort of going to talk about this kind of material and it sort of was in the formative stages. But this is, this is a regular pump, just like what we were talking. You know, you, you pull the handle here and there's a cylinder here and it goes back and forth and you pump air to the hose into your tire. Okay. So it's kind of, kind of like a regular pump that we described a moment ago. Um, but this one, now it's, it's connected to just the board here, and I see it's safety wired here. And, um, but anyway, these would just clamp onto your running board of your car. Now, we don't have running boards anymore, so you can't do that. But it would clamp on, so when it's time, if you've got a flat tire or something, it's time to pump the tire. You just take this out of your toolbox, you clamp it on there, you put the hose into your valve stem and pump away. When you're done, you take it out. So it was really handy like that. And that's the way they advertised it. Um, all kinds of different brands. This is a Yankee. And this is, uh, the brand name's a Yankee. And 1917, possibly. Um, I saw it in a couple catalogs, uh, Sears catalog from 1918. It costs you um, $3.25 without the pressure gauge. With the Ooh. gauge, it's three eighty-five. dollars So. Uh, this one does not have... The pressure gauge, no, this, I don't this is just, no. just the hose here, mm -hmm. okay. And I'm not even sure where the gauge would be. A lot of times yeah. it'd, it'd be just in line of the hose here. So, um, and it <clears> talked <throat> about the piston would not dry rot or deteriorate from non use and makes the pump the, the uh the piston makes the pump outlast any cars. It could furnish 200 pounds of pressure, which is way more than you need in any tire. <laughs> Okay, there's another brand called Rex, um, and that costs a little bit more. That was about $4.95 for, for a pump with the gauge. It was a buck more plus. So you had all sorts of things like this. Now, we also had another kind, and um, I'm, we're going to go off camera and go on location. Actually, Ooh. we're just going to go to one of our cars, and I'm going to show you <laughs> how that sets up with the... Um, with another thing, it's called the spark plug pump. So we'll be back in a moment. Okay, we are talking about different pumps earlier and we had the hand operated pumps. Well, they had this innovative thing um, that you could run off your engine uh, have an air pump for your tires. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna first read you uh, some stuff about it. It says, one of the most necessary parts of the equipment of the automobile, and the one that no car owner would think of starting on a trip without is an efficient tire pump. In many instances, an ordinary hand pump is considered sufficient. They're like what we were using, we were talking about a few minutes ago. Uh, but the tedious muscle straining work that is involved in using even the best of these devices caused many a motorist to defer the proper inflating of his tires when on a journey to their general detriment and frequently severe injury. Many contrivances have been produced with the object of doing this work with the aid of the motor itself and eliminating labor incidental thereto. And while some of them give very satisfactory service, they are often quite expensive and not to be and cannot be attached to every kind of engine. Okay, um, that's a, a press release that I saw on, on a device called a Mayo spark plug pump. Let me read you another moment here. Uh, the principal 
Op the principle of operation is similar to that of any cylinder pump, there being a small piston with rings which has a suction and compression stroke. When the piston is drawn down, it takes in air and when forced upward, it forces it into the tire. This piston is dependent on the strokes of the engine cylinder piston for its operation. But if the engine is raised, it will automatically lock itself. Okay, with that all said, we have one of these uh, spark plug air pumps here. This is Dan, and he approached the museum about a couple months ago, and yep. he says, you know, I found this thing. And I think on the phone you said it was a pump of some sort, and then as soon as you said mayo, yes. I thought, ah, it's an air pump. Yes. So why don't you show what you have in your hand? And that, that's a mayo pump. And it's not on this side, but on the other side, you, yeah. got, you got the little uh, tag there. And this is a spark plug pump. And there's a bunch of different uh, manufacturers of these things. And this is the way um, I got this from Dan, just as you see it here. And you can unscrew this bottom part, as he's doing. And the top part would be where it would plug into the... Um, to a spark plug. Now, if you had different sizes, you get different adapters for it and such. But you would just unscrew one of your spark plugs here and then stick it in just like that. Now, you're going to see some uh, advertisements. You're going to show, see a couple of advertisements. And the advertisements for Mayo are pretty neat. And um, let me read you a couple of the things they were saying. Is, and you'll be seeing these on your TV at the same time here. While the Mayo pumps the tire, you take it easy. No more backache, blistered hands and lame arms, splitting headache, perspiring, steaming, uh, and a day's pleasure spoiled by working over an out-of-date hand pump. Enjoy, enjoy yeah. tire pumping. It takes five minutes of complete relaxation by the roadside with a Mayo spark plug pump. Now, the picture you see there, it shows this man and a lady under a tree in the shade and having a nice time, and he's smoking a cigarette there, something you wouldn't see in today's advertising. But that's all you had to do, and you can see the picture. Um, you know, they have a, a, a pump there, and they have a hose coming from it, and I think it had like seven feet of hose or 10 or 12 or whatever it is. And you would just have the, the hose would attach up here to the top and go to your tire, okay? And um, you had a lot of flat tires back then too because I don't think the yeah, rubber is as good as it is now. Right. And the roads were a lot rougher. Terrible. And it was terrible. Horses were probably still around um, dropping um, nails. horseshoe nails all over the yep. place. And um, so because of that, you needed that. And um, you know, you always, there's numerous advertisements I've seen about fixing flat tires and stuff, but we won't even get into that. Now, I have another Mayo thing to, to tell you, and uh, I thought that was it, but um, excuse me, I have way too much paperwork here. Uh, you see another one that says, make tire pumping a pleasure. There's a way to enjoy next summer's heat when a tire goes flat. There's a way to laugh in the face of the hot sun. <laughs> and make tire pumping a recreation, a chance for a quiet smoke while Mayo, Mayo <laughs> spark plug pump and your motor do the work. So there it is. You would put this in. You you know you you turn your engine off first, okay, and then you take your your plug out and you put that in there and it pumps. And a lot of people ask, and, and Dan asked. I even looked when I first started looking into this. I thought, you know, you're <clears throat> going to have this raw. Um, fumes from yeah from the piston but actually the piston of your motor by creating pressure and suction back and forth um, there's a piston inside of here that that's actuated by the pressure and air or pressure and vacuum off your engine and that piston within this will create the air the pressurized air so they advertise it as like you know you could get 80 pounds of air out of this thing and and that sort of stuff. And um, that's what you need for today's tires. Um, so I'm looking at it, what, what do they cost? $12, you could get one of them. I have a feeling you probably paid a little bit yeah, more than that. More. Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, that is $12 and it came in a wooden box. Ooh. That's class right yeah. there. Did you get the wooden box? No. Oh. Wouldn't that be neat to have, a yeah. wooden box? Okay. Check on that. Now, now there's other things I came across, and Dan didn't know this until this evening, and I told him, and I've, 
when I went to Hershey, I was actually looking for this. I thought, boy, that'd be a cool thing to have. But um, you had a quick detachable spark plug. So you had a Mayo spark plug that would be in there all the time. You get a flat tire, and you would just take the, the center of the spark plug out, and you just put, put, this, put in. this in, and just boop, boop, and there you are. You're ready to go. Okay, so, so that's it. Now, I don't know how quick, because it would be kind of hot there. So, and there was another device, and this is a bad engine to have an example of, but um, on a lot of the older engines, you would have a cap in here for the valves, and you take that cap off and you could get to the valves. Well, there was a device there you could screw in, and so it was a permanent connection that you would have for, for that at all times. And I thought that was kind of neat. So, does it say anything about using certain plugs? No, well, it, it just said every bit of advertisement I saw talks about an adapter. Adapter. And I'm thinking, well, they had more than one size of plugs. Because now I had two of them, I was showing you the, sure. those old rusty things, and I think they were different size threads. So, I don't know what this universal adapter, I tried finding things, but I'm sure there's an explanation somewhere. So. Guess so. you'd have to know how many different size spark plugs are there. Oh yeah, so to, to uh, make an adapter. Yeah, so I don't know. I, I came across other brands. Um, you're gonna you're gonna see advertisements there. Uh, the Brown Impulse uh, spark plug pump uh, made by the Brown Company out of Syracuse, New York. It's this is talking about the same thing. Um, are you going to sweat and strain inflating your tires like you always have, or are you going to use a brown impulse tire pump and let your motor do the pumping? So here it was, this is easy life, you know, you let your motor do it. And um, they had a quick de detachable plug with, with the brown deal and um, all sorts of things like that. Uh, there's another brand, Specialty Auto Parts, same idea, utility pump and new, ma and new meter spark plug pump. That was $10 in 1915. And um, that actually, the, the utility pump and new meter, uh, when you got to a certain pressure, it, you could set the pressure and when it got to it, it let out a whistle. Sure. And I thought that was neat because not only could you relax, you'd probably take a nap. And it like would an and say, okay, tire's done, let's yep. go. And so, you know, that was probably high class stuff back then. Um, and then I, I was doing, I was on the internet and I was looking around and there's stuff like that today too. Yes. And, um, you know, right off of the spark plug and I found something that was a kit for ATVs, okay, all terrain vehicles. And I was reading that and I think it's probably like 20 years old or 30 years old because it was talking about three and four wheeled ATVs, whereas three wheels aren't around anymore. No. So they've been gone for quite a while. And then um, I came across something else, not quite a tire pump, but it was kind of interesting. It's called Duplicolor. It's a touch up spray gun with spark plug, compressor, and tire pump. So there you go. You could, <laughs> you could paint your car using your spark plug spark hole. hole. And, uh, and that was, actually, that was, I think, from the 50s. It was about $6 for the one of those kits. So that was pretty deep. So, so there you go. Now you know everything about that, I think. You know, maybe not. Yep. Um, I, I, was, I was telling Dan earlier before we went on camera, um, I had a couple of um, uh, patent uh, things describing this. But if you ever read a patent, they get quite detailed and tedious and boring maybe and I thought well and, and neither of them were exactly like this uh, I didn't read them I'll let you have them you can read them yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'll check them out. that time reading yeah. yeah yeah so okay and that's pretty much um, what we have about this and we have other pumps uh, that we're going to talk about in a minute or two but we're going to go off camera here for for a while Okay, I am still here with Dan. Uh, we're taking a little break from the air pump uh, material. And Dan brought his car here. And this is a fantastic car. It's nice and clean, a lot cleaner than my car. And a lot nicer looking, the color and stuff. And so what do you have here? Well, this is a 2009 Dodge Challenger. 
Mm -hmm. uh, the first year was actually 2008 that they came out and they're still in production now yet. Uh, this had the choice of three motors. It was a V6, it was a 5.9 Hemi, or the 6.1 Hemi. Uh, the 6.1 Hemi had quite a bit of horsepower. That was probably over 350, 400. Oh, it's over 400 horsepower. Because mm. this one, I think, is 360. Okay. And uh, it's been a real popular car. You see a lot of them around. Um, a limited color. It's, this color was only available for like a month when it came out because at that time Chrysler was having problems and they only left your order at the February 28th and whatever was uh, assigned a VIN number then would, would be produced as a 2009. Everything else would be a 2010. Okay, and you said they had problems with the color? No, okay. but it was a limited color. Oh, a limited color. I'm, you could I'm only sorry. get it yeah. starting February 28th okay. is when I got it, and it was only available for maybe two weeks to a mm -hmm. month. Uh, it's a spring color. They call it B5 Blue. B5 Blue, okay. So okay. It, it's, it's a limited color that you can get. The car is available in an in a automatic or a six-speed manual transmission. Mm -hmm. uh, it has a, a few options on it, like a, the posi traction. There's a button on the dash for posi traction mm -hmm. that you can turn it on or off at will. Okay. Uh, there's no computerized features on it at any time. It's, it's completely just the basic car. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. But now, now, you were telling me, and this, this is kind of interesting because it sort of fits in with our air pump uh, episode, we'll say. Sure. And something about the, you, the when, spare tire and the air and all that. Yeah, when thing, I ordered it, it, I ordered it locally here in Boyertown, and they, he said, do you want a spare tire? And it just took me by surprise because I thought you automatically get a spare tire. That's, part, that's the American but way, you get a spare this, tire. With this, what they're doing with all the Challengers, and even the old ones, the, the 70, 71, 72, okay. they came with a, an air compressor and a can of composite that you could f repair your tire with. Okay, and that was sort of like fix a flat, right? Yeah. Okay. And but it's, it's, it's a, I'll show you that, it's a compressor that the canister goes on, mm -hmm. and you can turn a dial to either just pump up the tire if it's a slow leak or what, Right. Or you can put a, a tire repair. Okay. And this operates through your cigarette lighter? Yes. Okay. And so, and that came automatically with it. Yes. And, but it didn't have a spare tire. Now, is that an option? Yes. The spare tire was $100. Then you didn't get the air compressor. Okay. Okay. So, I actually, I went and, and I bought the air compressor later mm -hmm. with the canister. Okay. On. I'll so show you was, that in the back. It was either or. You couldn't yes. get both of them. Yes. That's interesting. Yeah. So... So it's a nice car. How much? So you've had it a while, right? Yes, I bought it new. Okay, and a lot of mileage, or you're kind of careful. How Three thousand miles. Three thousand miles. Okay, so you drove it here tonight. So yes, I'm glad you did. Yes. So no, it, it gets driven. It just, it's got to be a nice day yeah. or mm -hmm. a good reason for me to take it out. And, and you got it in, in front of our gas station, seventeen point six cents a gallon. I wish. Yeah, don't we all wish? Except it's not too bad out there right no, now. No, no. Okay, I have Charlie here, and he has a car that he brought, and he wanted to kind of show it off in front of our gas station here, yes. so we, we made the accommodations. Um, it's a really nice car, and tell me a little bit about it. First of all, what is it? I mean, we know it's a Ford, okay? It's a 1934 two-door sedan. Okay, okay. Uh, Bright red. Bright so. red, it's got a three, it's a Chrysler red. Okay. It's got a 327, 69, 327 in it. Mm -hmm. A little mm -hmm. bit of a cam, not much. Mm -hmm. And uh, got a 350 transmission. It's got the eight inch Ford rear in it. Okay. I put a Hyatt front end under it. Now, now you mentioned that before, that Hyatt front end. Now, why did you put the front end? Was, was there problems with it? had a Mustang two front end under it. Right, and right. And I didn't like it, it didn't handle real good. Okay. I got it aligned, it would shimmy on me at a higher speed. Mm -hmm. And a buddy of mine in a coupe said he put a high front end on it, right, much better. Okay. He said, if a coupe can do it, sedan's going to be better. Yeah, because it's a little heavier. So I had sedan. one put under it, and it handles better. It still rides like a buckboard. Mm -hmm. That's the way they are, mm -hmm. but it handles a lot better than that. Other it, it handles a lot better than an original 1930 Ford. Yes. A lot better. Okay. Right. And you were telling me this is all steel body. 
He'll buy and uh, fiberglass fender. fenders, okay. And it's so. got the digital gauges in it, which I don't really care for because you okay. can't see them with the sunlight yeah. shining on them. Yeah, yeah. I know, and I know my modern car, I have the, the radio is digital. And with the sun, it's a, it's a pain. But the rest of the gauges, I'm happy with. So, so. And you drive this a lot, too? Yes. Oh, you do. Okay. Well, almost so. every weekend we're at shows. Really? Okay. It's not really a show car. It's a fun car. Okay. I go mm -hmm. to a show, I close the door, and I walk away and okay. have a good time. But you say probably in, in decent weather. Um, now, we're taping this. It's the middle of December. But I think it was 57 degrees and sunny today. So yes. I think we did that just so you could bring your car here. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate oh, it. Oh, yeah. No problem. <laughs> yeah. All right, we have another pump here we're going to talk about. We're not going to talk about trains. I know you viewers got all excited about that, but it's part of our Christmas celebration, right? It's part of the christmas vacation of our yes. gallery. Yes, cool. Okay. <laughs> anyway, we're going to talk about another pump, and uh, Kendra and I are standing in front of the museum's 1920 Packard with Fleetwood body on it. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. And uh, this car has been sitting here for quite a while and then one day I noticed something this little box type thing we can, you can open this up like here I was investigating and I opened it up and I saw a hose in there that's just a little storage contain, compartment empty right now yeah and there's a hose there and a gauge and I thought how about that and I saw a hose fitting right here and I attached the hose. Actually, Tom attached the hose, I believe. But anyway, what this is, is a tire pump. And this hose here goes over, and we got it hooked up to the tire right here. And, um, you know, nothing spectacular there. But again, what this is, um, you get a flat tire on the road, you could pump it up with with the um with the car itself and these were motor driven pumps that's the way they used to talk about them and um it, there's a little air pump you can't see it of course but the little air pump that operates off the transmission and when you want it to operate you just pull a little lever here inside the car and it engages the gears and it starts pumping away um actually not this one <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, most of them did have a little lever, but this, you just have this little, uh, this little pull thing here and, and that would get it pumping here. And we got an inline gauge here and you could tell the amount of air you're going to use. Now, this car, I crawled underneath it and I, I was telling somebody right a, a little bit ago. You're very brave. Yeah, well, the <laughs> thing is, I thought, okay, these cars have a lot of ground clearance. I mean, what is that? Yeah. 14 inches, 16 inches, a lot of problem, or a lot, a lot of room there. Well, underneath this compartment, it goes down and there's only about a foot and I'm there and <clears throat> I would touch something and I'd get this shower of rust <laughs> in my face. And so I crawl under there, I got my light, I got, I got cleaners and everything, and I found this tire pump and did not find any um, identification. It was just oh. this pump sitting there. So I was kind of miffed, okay? That was rude. Oh, very Didn't rude. Didn't they know you were going to be crawling under this car? I don't know. What were they thinking of? No, I'm thinking it could have been put on by a decal that got worn off years ago, mm -hmm. but mostly stuff like this, you know, this is 1920-ish. <laughs> Um, it would be kind of cast into the housing of that pump, but nothing. So let me tell you about some of the pumps out there. You had the Crane Transmission Powered Pump, 1917, it cost you eight bucks. And again, this pump is not much bigger than, you know, a little pump, you know, a couple fists in size. Uh, Crane was made by Bay State Pump Company in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, it inflates uh, 34 by four tires to 80 pounds in four minutes. So if you viewers were wondering how much air these tires get, about 80 pounds, plus or minus, you know, depending. But it would do it in four minutes. So we we're looking at the Mayo pump where people were taking it easy, lounging yeah. under a tree and stuff. I guess you could lounge under that same tree while this is pumping up. Hey, why not? And uh, actually, this is a little easier to use because all you have to do is hook the, the hose up. 
no hot spark plugs to mess around with. But anyway, that was the crane. You'll see an advertisement there. Eight bucks it cost you. Uh, said to pump that nine out of ten motors want ought to make some easy money for you. That would be kind of geared towards a garage owner who would be selling that. Uh, Kellogg Motor Power Air Pump. That was probably the biggest brand. I see all sorts of Kellogg stuff uh, out there. And um, one of their advertisements, I noticed it was factory supplied on a Daniels car. <clears throat> we got two Daniels over there, and both of them have pumps on them. But neither, they? neither of them are Kellogg. They're oh. Trojan pumps, um, but they're not 1918. That's uh, this advertisement was um, from 1918. The plot thickens. Oh, plot is thickening. Yes. <laughs> There's another one called Casco. You'll see an advertisement for that. Uh, that's out in New York City. That costs you $12. Uh, equipped with 12 feet of, of rubber hose. I'm thinking this might be 12 feet here. I don't know. Somewhere in there. Yeah. Okay. Um, and that Casco thing was made by a company called uh, Edward A. Cassidy Company. Okay, doing a little bit of investigation here. They made other kind of tire pump things. They made a, a chemical, I guess, called Nitrex. That was their brand name for it. It was for tires, but it was not for tires that are on the car, but on spare tires. And you would, you'd put this liquid on the tires and it was a flexible coating for spare tires to preserve during non-use. So, you know, tires sitting there, you know, these tires get dry rotted and, you know, we have, we have problems a lot of with tires that. here. Yeah. Yeah. They dry rot, they can leak air, um, but you would put this coating on and it would preserve them. And when you're ready to use the tire on the car, you could just peel this stuff off. It was, oh. you know, Think of like rubber gloves or something, yeah. you know? And you could use it and it would look like it's a brand new tire. I thought that wow. was an interesting thing. Uh, another one, Stewart Motor Driven Tire Pump. And I was, saw some stuff, uh, the advertisement you're looking at is from 1916. And Stewart made all sorts of things. They made fuel pumps, they made uh, gauges, like Stuart Warner gauges. Uh, I think that part of the company is still floating around here. That costs you $12. So it, you, when you order these things, you would say what kind of car you you have, and it would supply you with the brackets for it, and you could you could do that. So there it is. There's some um, additional tire pumping things for you, and um, I came out with some other things. Since we're standing here, I guess I can talk about them. Am I allowed to do that? Sure, why not? Sure, yeah, why not? Okay. Um, something called Blue Devil Puncture Stop. And you're looking at advertisement, that's from 1920. So uh, Kendra, you're not looking at the advertisement. It's spelled no. B-L-U-D-E-V-L. That is a problem with spelling oh, back yeah. there. I noticed yeah. that. Okay, they didn't have spell check. Anyway, it was made <laughs> by Swan Manufacturing Company out of Lima, Ohio. And um, basically it was some sort of coating you'd put in your tire to prevent um, punctures and it said blue devil puncture stop is a scientifically scientifically prepared uh, mineral preparation which safeguards tires against punctures and premature deterioration so in other words you'd put it right into a regular tire there preserves rubber by preventing the formulation or the formation of sulfuric acid by the reaction of oxygen and sulfur contained in the tube the development of pinholes and rotten spots in the tube are attributed to this acid. So it would kind of chemically counterbalance that, I guess. Uh, it's not a tire fill, filler, nor is it gummy or sticky. I've heard that stuff about some of the stuff you put in the tires today, you know, this gummy and sticky stuff. Uh, it only occupies space and does not interfere with the resiliency of the tire. So there you go. Get some Blue Devil. It's scientifically proven. Mm -hmm. I wonder if they have anything to do with Duke University. They're the Blue Devils. So. Where was this company? Ohio. Oh. I guess not. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. Then you, the next advertisement you're looking at is a locks on air chuck. Okay. Meaning you have an air chuck. That's where you're putting your air in your tire. Just like this is a little thing here to plug it in, but it locks on. 
again, LOX is not L-O-C-K-S, it's L-O-X. -O -O isn't yeah, it? Yeah, LOX on, okay. Um, simple and strong, everlasting and efficient, the LOX on air chuck answers the crying need of Ooh. garage men everywhere for a chuck that can be used indefinitely without wearing or leaking. And, um, and that's kind of interesting, and I believe it's, it's that one that when you get to a certain pressure, it whistles. They like whistles back oh, then. Yeah. And, um, but that's neat. Yeah. That's yeah. So you don't really have to pay attention yeah. that closely. Yeah. So, and then we had another one. Uh, we have a polo pneumatic alarm. Polo, as in Marco Polo. Like, yeah, P -O -L -O. Like water polo. W water polo, Marco yep. Polo. Pelopines. You know where I'm from? Okay, you got that? Okay, <laughs> uh, Polo Pneumatic Alarm, 1914, made by the Polo Tire Alarm Company out of Chicago. They say it's the real lifesaver, a tire dumb. Ooh. Yeah, that's a word you don't see much. No, okay. ever. Really. Yeah, I don't think that would show up on, um, on spell check. I think it what would be th underlined red. What do you think, Gus? <laughs> so anyway, it says pump up your tires to the proper pressure for good service, then attach a polo alarm and forget it. So you pump up your tires and right here where your, um, your valve stem is, you, you put on this polo tire alarm. The alarm will tell you instantly and emphatically when any tire needs attention. So there you go, you, you're losing air pressure it oh. would make a, a whistle sound for you again. Oh, I just so, get the little idiot light in my, on my dashboard Yeah, now. well, that was an idiot auto yeah. alarm thing. But I you don't need know. four. Yeah, you'd have four of them. And I guess it was loud enough, supposedly, while you're driving down the road, you could hear it. And these cars were kind of noisy. As you can see, it's kind of open, so it'd be the wind noise. I bet the horses loved oh, this. Yeah. So, so we, we have this device here, <clears throat> uh, the locks on air chuck with the whistler when you mm -hmm. get enough pressure. <laughs> okay, and then you have a polo pneumatic alarm okay, when you lose little. pressure. <laughs> and there's another one in here called the Whistler Pressure Regulator, and you just put it in the same deal. So, kind of interesting things there. So you'll see all those advertisements on, on the screen there. Um, polo pneumatic alarm, four dollars, or excuse me, six dollars for a set of four. Oh, so you do okay. one all the way all around. Right. So, so yeah, that's it. Okay. I like it. And that, that's it for now. We're going to go back to the diner, right? Okay. And um, we're going to talk, actually, we're going to give you a little break from this air pressure thing. Oh, that's right. We, got we have an update, base, don't we? An update, yeah. An and update. then we'll go back to the diner. Yeah. Okay. So last month, we presented you all at home with a little mystery here about our 1909 Middle Bay's air-cooled engine mm -hmm. and we did get some responses so Dan why don't you take us through that because this is way too mechanical okay <laughs> what, what what the question was is we have two we have an exhaust valve at the top of the cylinder we have another one at the bottom of the cylinder <laughs> and we figured out what this bottom was what it was for it was for scavenging the hot air out of the engine better because this is air-cooled engine and water-cooled and Anyway, it, it's an air-cooled engine, and to get it cooler quicker, that's where the scavenging uh, lower valve comes in. Well, it has two exhaust pipes going all the way to the back of the car, dual exhaust. Mm -hmm. huh? Pretty uh -huh. cool. Okay. Um, the lower exhaust has a muffler on it with a valve at the end of the muffler, and the question was, what is that valve for? Now, there's a little pedal that the driver can operate that opens or closes the valve. I, actually, it would be closing the valve. It normally stays open. And we wanted to know, what is the valve for? And we kind of left it over open to the viewers, and we had a couple calls about it. Or we had a couple of answers, rather. And one of them was um, like a braking system. And if you're familiar with trucks and you have the Jake brake, mm -hmm. that, that, like in town, they're not allowed because they're too noisy, I guess, in it makes all the dogs bark, and um, especially the St. Bernards. Oh, but anyway, um, and so it was like a braking action on it, but I discounted that because if that was being closed, you're still, it wouldn't have the braking effect and your exhaust would still go out the other valve as in a normal car. 
But the other answer is to heat the engine up quicker. So when you first start your engine, although you want to cool the engine, you have to have a little bit of heat to get it at an operating temperature. Mm -hmm. And so to do that, you close the bottom valve. It doesn't scavenge the hot air and so it heats up quicker. And it's only a temporary thing. That's why you'd have the pedal. It's a spring loaded pedal. And so you push the pedal, it opens that valve, or excuse me, closes the valve. And so th these, these uh, exhaust valves down here, I mean, they're still working, but there's no exhaust going out of it. And so all your exhaust is going out of the top one, it heats up quicker. And when you have it good operating temperature, you get your foot off the pedal and your exhaust goes like it should be. You understand all that? Yes, I it did. It will be on the quiz. Okay. All right, I'm ready. Okay. You, you did a very good job explaining okay, that. Okay, good, you. good. Mm -hmm. So that's our answer. Yeah. So thanks to everyone that uh, submitted their ideas. We liked reading through them. So. Yeah, so. So. Okay. Now we're going back to the diner? Yeah, now we're going back to the diner. Okay, here we are back in the diner, and we're here to talk about more air pumps. The, you, the Yankee air pump works. Yeah, it does. But There's it, a little hiss there. Uh, yeah. Oh, that means it works. That's right. Okay. Anyway, we uh, talked about all sorts of air pumps, <clears throat> ones that you could attach to your spark plug hole in your car, uh, air pumps that run off the transmission. We have this, the Yankee pump here, uh, you know, regular hand pump, and all sorts of things. Well, and... Uh, like in the 20s. Oh, actually, I'm looking at my dates here. Back before the 20s, you would have pumps that you could go to your local service station, your garage, and you could get pumps. You could get your air pump with a machine. Now, if you had a flat tire in your road, that wouldn't work really. But if you had a low tire, your spare needed air, you could go here. Uh, I have a couple. Uh, brand names here for you. One of them was the Lipman Free Air Service Station out of Wisconsin. It said free air service is appreciated and a Lipman pump installed near a show window cannot help but to stimulate the buying impulse. Now, it's interesting because they're saying, well, you have a garage here, you have a, a dealership, whatever, a car dealership, you put this Lipman pump here, people are going to come, look in your showroom, uh, through the windows, yeah. through the windows, and want to buy your product. And, you know, that was kind of the, the, the cool thing about the free air there. Subliminal. Subliminal, yeah. Marketing. And it was a water-cooled pump, and it was uh, powered by a little electric motor there, and uh, $250 would put you up. It'd be neat to get one of them for a gas yeah. station here, wouldn't it? Okay. I, I think it would be a little more than $250. Probably. A little more. Because I've seen... Inflation and all that. Yeah. You know. Inflation. I get it. I get it. Inflation. Air pump. And uh, a little bit of diner humor. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's diner humor. But you, right. know, you know, it's interesting. And I was telling you about this a few days ago, Kendra. Um, you know, I've seen these <laughs> air pumps for sale at flea markets. And they cost a bundle of money. And we're talking stuff from the 50s. Now, yeah. this is from like 1920, 1915, somewhere mm -hmm. back, way back then. So, anyway, that's the Lipman Free Air Service um, Pump and Station. And then there's another brand, and this is Eco, which is spelled E-C-O, pronounced Eco, out of Western Manufacturing Company, Oskaloosa, Iowa. Isn't that a great name yeah, of the town? Great. If I had to live somewhere, Rolls off the Oskaloosa. Anyway, 1916 or 17, first Eco air meter was made available. Uh, they were called the economy air meters. And um, anyway, somewhere in there, um, I think it was 1917, the Model 8 was made. And there was also a Model 20. <coughs> anyway, it could be equipped with coin attachment. Attachment required a nickel, <coughs> dime, or quarter to get air. And it was kind of interesting because the Lipman, with their advertising, you got free air, and it's going to help the customer come to your store because he's getting free air and yeah. see in your window. Whereas this eco in the advertisement you're looking at there, kind of opposite tact. In other words, um, 
you know, you're going to have an air pump and you might as well make some money because people need air. That's and right. uh, unless they get a Yankee air pump like this. And so um, that was that was kind of interesting that way back then you had coin operator pumps. And I remember, I don't know, back in the 80s, maybe when they started having coin operated pumps, you know, here in Pennsylvania and say, oh, no, what do you mean? Air is free. Air what do you be mean? Free. Yeah, well, you know, so be it. And now I understand there's certain places that do have free air. We were just mm -hmm. told about by our, our wonderful camera guy mm -hmm. did that. So anyway, so that's pretty much it for putting air in your tires. So I'm done. You're done? Yeah. He's checked out for the night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, checked out. Yeah. I, uh, I'm deflated. <laughs> so, okay. How many All more right. bad jokes can we cram into the next uh, few minutes? We could no. several of them, but we'll, we'll let you do it now. Well, you know, we, I'm going to get away from air okay. for a little bit. Um, you know, we, we went and visited uh, the Middleby, right. which we talked about last month. Mm -hmm. I'm going to revisit something else we talked about last month. Um, we, were, we did a lot on the cycle car craze of the 19-teens, right. and we were in our lobby, because that's, that's what we have on exhibit right now. <clears throat> and if you recall, I mentioned the first cycle car built here in the United States, which was most unfortunately called the Dodo. Mm. And that was built <clears throat> in 1912 in Detroit. And I said it was built by a young engineer named Carl Probst. And like I... Carl Probst, Carl yes. Probst. And I said last month, uh, you know, he later went on to work for the Milburn Wagon Company. And we have a Milburn electric car in our collection. Same and company there. Yes. Even though okay. it's called the Milburn Wagon mm -hmm. Company, they got into electric cars. And we have one of those cars here. And you asked, asked me what else he did, and I did not have an answer for you last month. But I made good on my promise. Oh. And I did more research. Uh, <clears throat> so Carl Probst, just a little background, he was born in Point Pleasant, West Virginia in 1883. And he went to Ohio State University. He got a degree in engineering in 1906. So not long after that, he built his dodo, and that mm. was about his, one of his first, you know, real jobs, so to speak. So after that, he goes on to the Milburn Wagon Company, and in late September of 1914, Milburn begins to build the 1915 model of the Milburn Light Electric, which was based on his design, and we have one of those cars in our museum, you'll see a, uh, an image of it right there on the screen. <clears throat> uh, and they built those cars, basically it's the same car, uh, between 1915 and 1923. About 4,000 of those cars uh, the Milburn Company built. Now that's all I knew about Carl Probst last month. But I learned something else, that he's uh, got another connection hmm. to something in our museum. Now, a couple months ago, maybe you remember we did, it might have been almost a year ago now exactly, we talked about the museum's 1940 Bantam Roadster. Yes. Yes, mm -hmm. little Another small, small car. little car. Yep. yep. Uh, and we have one on display. They were built out in Butler, Pennsylvania, so out in Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. I recall that for that segment, you sat in the car, and it's very, very tiny. Yeah, I kind of wore the car. Yeah. <laughs> I know how it goes. Now, Bantam is credited with building the prototype of what we now call the Jeep. Mm -hmm. So, now, at that point, and that was about 1940, Bantam is on its last legs financially, um, but they still uh, make this Jeep for the World War II effort. Um, they didn't get the contract to build them, because the company was deemed unable to handle the numbers that the military needed, and that's probably true. Um, we'll get to that a little later. So Willys and Ford are going to really build the World mm -hmm. War II Jeeps, yep. but it all began with Bantam. Carl Probst is known as the father of the Jeep because he is the one credited with designing the Bantam Jeep prototype. How about that? However. Oh. There's a however. 
It's like a disclaimer. That's right. There is some controversy, we'll say, over uh, what exactly Probst did with relation to the Jeep. Um, and there's a photo you'll see on screen uh, of that prototype, and he's standing all the way to the left. He's kind of got his arm on the uh, tire in the back. But uh, most of the design work on the Jeep was completed, really, by a joint effort between the military and the Bantam employees before Probst was even brought on board. Hmm. Um, it seems that Probst was brought on because of a last-minute decision by the Quartermaster Corps, which demanded not only the completed prototype, but also formal drawings in order for that to mm -hmm. be considered. Um, and the Bantam factory, I said they were on their last legs, they were down to just 16 employees at this point. Wow. including the night watchman. Oh. So they don't, they don't really have that many people, and they needed someone who could put their ideas down on paper quickly, so they hired Carl Probst to do that. So while his name is officially on the documents because he actually drew, drew them up, it seems he didn't actually do much of the designing and engineering. He just kind of put it on paper, mm. which is why he gets the credit, but maybe not necessarily did... A huge amount of the work. Okay. So that's my update on Mr. Probst there. Mr. Probst. Yeah. Okay. So I did my homework. Good. Good. Can I get out of the middle B air cooled quiz now? Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, uh, we're actually we're out of time tonight. We are. Yeah, okay. we are. So um, we thank you all for joining us this month, and mm -hmm. uh, we will see everybody in the new year. Yeah. Right. And since we're in the diner, I'm going to ask Doris over there for another piece of pie. Yeah, so. good luck. She's Doris. a little grumpy today. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see you next okay. year. See ya. Well, Dan, I'm sure you knew that we had a gift shop. Oh, yes, I do know. Yes, yeah, so yeah. maybe our viewers at home do not know. Uh, but, you know, we've got lots of stuff for sale here. Please, if you're looking for, like, an automotive gift, something with our logo, a past Durier Day item, those especially, what I last mentioned, the Durier Day items, uh, you know, those are really pretty good, well marked down, too. So you'll find some good deals here. These are from past Durier Days. Especially those glasses, they're really nice. They're nice, heavy-duty glasses. I know, I break glasses all the time at home. Even just putting them in the dishwasher. These are really nice and heavy-duty. Uh, we also got lots of stuff with our logo on them. We got nice shirts, sweatshirts, hats, thermoses, coffee mugs, the travel mugs. Uh, and also very popular are diner mugs. Um, if you come here for diner day, you've been here in the past, you've probably uh, seen us selling those diner mugs. Well, they're not just for sale on diner day. They're for sale all the time. Uh, and they're really neat. So, you know, come here for that. Postcards, other car stuff like puzzles, if you've got someone uh, you're looking to buy a gift for, automotive, please stop in. And our stuff is really reasonably priced, too. Mm -hmm. You can't really complain yeah, about I have, that. I have some shirts. And mm -hmm. I wear them proudly. I've got some hats. I proudly wear that at Hershey. Yeah. Make sure people know where I'm from. So. And we can find you easier. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if that's the case, we should have bright green ones. Some camo ones. Yeah. Camo hats. But well, everybody that makes else you blend wears in. camo hats. Mm -hmm. so. But uh, yeah, we've got lots of stuff here. So please, if you're looking for something, a gift for somebody or for yourself, don't forget us. And uh, if you're a member of the museum, uh, you do get a discount on your gift shop. Mm -hmm purchases. That's another thing. We do have uh, membership levels. They're very reasonable. Individual memberships start at $25. That's a really great value. Um, members get a quarterly newsletter and that covers a little bit of everything that goes on here. Some history, uh, upcoming events, photos and details from past events. Uh, it's, it's good, right? You like the newsletter? It is, yeah. Mm -hmm. Especially when I've Good contributed answer. to it. 
especially your article. Yes. <laughs> Dan and I will both contribute stuff to the newsletter mm -hmm. at times. And uh, members also get into the museum free as many times as you want during the year. And that's a great value. You can come to Diner Day, both Diner Days, and not pay the admission, mm -hmm. that means. Um, and we have so many great events coming up this year that membership would come in handy. So, and if you're an individual, come to the museum five times, you might as well just buy a membership. Right. And then you'll get right. the newsletter. Because, and, and I've noticed in the past couple years that we've kind of ramped up the the um, membership benefits, you know, mm -hmm. about having free events and stuff for the members, and so that's pretty good. It's a great value. Mm -hmm. So, if you have any uh, questions about any of this, the membership, stuff for sale in the gift shop, Come visit us here at 85 South Walnut Street or uh, call us at 610-367-2090 and we'd love to hear from you.